Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show, folks. My name is Tony, and on the show as guest today, I have John Haller. And it's a pretty interesting show. I hope you'll enjoy it. And don't forget to visit our website, a minute to midnight.com, and we do run it 100% by donations. And I want to say thank you to people that help us because we could not do this without your help. I want to welcome John Heller back on the A Minute to Midnight show. John's a regular guest and always we have fascinating discussions and I can tell you today we are not going to run out of topics to talk about. There is so much. So John, it's great to have you on the show again today. It's good to be back. It's nice to come back and on a day when everything is so calm and uh, nothing, nothing's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nothing's going on. Yeah. Yes. Okay, shall we start? You recently were at the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. Can right. you tell our listeners Actually, what that is? Yeah, it's Christ at the Checkpoint. Oh, sorry, Christ uh, at the Checkpoint. Yeah, their first uh, conference was held in 2010 in Bethlehem, and the first uh, five conferences, maybe it was 2012, they've had, they've had five conferences every two years. Uh, this year they had their, um, they had their Bethlehem Israel conference in June, early June of, of, uh, excuse me, early, excuse me, early June of 2018. It uh, is a group of, uh, no other way to describe them than uh, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel, people who claim to be Palestinian Christians. Uh, Over the years, they have had a string of people in that support generally leftist pro-Palestinian causes. They, one of the early speakers was a uh, the wife of Bill Hybels, Lynn Hybels. She spoke at the conference two or three times in Bethlehem in the early years. Uh, the conference uh, organizers are generally associated with Bethlehem Bible College. They are rabidly pro-Palestinian. They never say anything against the Palestinian Authority, and they rail continually about the occupation, the oppression of the Israeli uh, army, the IDF, Benjamin Netanyahu, and and also their probably their biggest, uh, one of the biggest themes of the conference this year was fight Christian Zionists, Christians who support Israel. They call them Christian Zionists, and also support the BDS, the Boycott, Divest, and Sanction Movement. Uh, they came; they were quite explicit in some of the sessions that I were in about that. Every year, though, they they also will have a generally a pro-Zionist, pro-Israel Christian of some sort. They've had Daryl Bach from Dallas Seminary in the past. Last year or in June, they had Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown, uh, to defend Christian Zionism. At this conference this year, they had a professor from Beeson Divinity School in in Birmingham, Alabama, named Gerald McDermott. He was the token Zionist. The featured speaker, though, at this year's conference, he has spoken in the past, but he's been absent for the last two or three Bethlehem conferences was the Anglican Bishop, uh, Stephen Sizer. Sizer is uh, well known for his anti-Semitism. He actually was recently forced out of, he was suspended for a while because of some of the anti-Semitic posts that he had made on his social media, not the least of which was the Jews were behind 9-11, the Jews caused 9-11, um, which is a theory that you know I see bandied about quite a bit, even in even in the Christian community. But Sizer, uh, some of his most recent posts were bad enough that even the Anglican bishop that he answered to in England said, "You need to take some time off." He did come back for a short time, and now he has uh, retired. He's, I would say, he's around his mid sixties. So he was the featured speaker at this year's conference, and he always has a, a thing about how do you attack uh, Christian Zionism. Uh, the title of his talk is was this year, I have the handout, Seven Biblical Answers to Popular Questions about Israel and the Church. 
for example, he asks the question, does God bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel? Are the uh, Jewish people God's chosen people? Uh, third question, was the promised land given by God exclusively to the Jewish people as their inheritance? Number four, is Jerusalem the exclusive, undivided, and eternal capital of the Jewish people? Um, five, must the Jewish temple be rebuilt before Jesus can return? Uh, six, will believers soon be raptured to heaven before the end time battle of Armageddon? And does God have a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church? And that was essentially the outline of his talk. He then did a panel with McDermott. Uh, they had a number of other speakers. They had uh, Alex Awad, who uh, seems to be one of the organizers. He's a Palestinian who, a Palestinian Arab. And I, I, I always use the term Palestinian um, with some trepidation because uh, I, I, I only do it because that's what they call themselves. Uh, there never really has been a country called Palestine, despite the fact that the UN recently gave the state of Palestine uh, special rights to head up a large group of on a line. They call it the group of 77 in China uh, is actually the name of the group at the UN so that the Palestinian Palestinians can head up some committees and that sort of thing. So McDermott was on a panel. Uh, one of the other, I think, main organizers of the conference is a, a person who was a longtime professor of Bible at Wheaton College, Wheaton University, named Gary Burge. About a year ago, he left Wheaton and he now uh, teaches at Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So Burge was there, he did the morning devotions each morning, and essentially it was, here's why you can't believe Christian, pal or you can't believe in anything associated with Christian Zionism. Some of the things that Burge said, I you know, I don't know whether Burge is uh, rabidly anti-Semitic, anti-Israel. He is very pro-Palestinian, but he made some things that I think were just uh, sort of egregious errors that I think sort of reveal a little bit of a underlying anti-Semitism. The main example would be this. He started off by saying, well, you know, at this time and the uh, at the time of Jesus, he had us open to Luke chapter four. At this time in Israel and this part of the world, the people were largely illiterate. Uh, he then proceeded to tell the story where Jesus and in, in Luke, the last part of Luke chapter four, where Jesus went into the synagogue at, of Nazareth at Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry. And then he proceeds to read from the scripture, which says, and they handed Jesus the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he opened the book and read from the book of Isaiah to everybody there that was listening in the synagogue. Now, this, this claim that they were uh, largely illiterate, I think is a, it, it's a claim that's not met, it's, that's not, that doesn't match up with the evidence. For example, if, if the people in this world at this time were largely illiterate, then why did the son of, of a carpenter from a very small village at the time, Nazareth was probably maybe only 100 people, how was it he was, and, and I know he was the Messiah and that sort of thing, but how was it that he got up to read? And we know from an earlier story in the Gospels that when Jesus was 12, he and his family went to the temple in Jerusalem and he stayed around to argue with the scribes in the temple. Well, illiterate 12-year-old boys and 30-year-old uh, illiterate men don't get up to read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah in the synagogue. So I think this is a this is a trope that they were largely illiterate. The one other thing that they do at Christ at the Checkpoint is they try to change the narrative. They try to uh, and this is a this is a Marxist thing that they do. They they talk about the colonial occupying power at the time Jesus was born, the Roman colonial occupying power. And what they're doing is they're trying to compare it to the modern day state of Israel, the colonial occupying power that oppresses us. Uh, and they talk about how Jesus was oppressed. And in fact, they have come out, some of them and have even said Jesus himself was a Palestinian refugee, because we know that when Herod uh, started killing the babies in Bethlehem, 
Mary, Joseph, and Jesus fled to Egypt. Although they didn't flee across any empire lines, they still stayed within what appeared to be, at least based on my research, the confines of the Roman Empire at that time. So they 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 sort of changed the biblical narrative to support their political views. And their political views is the Palestinians should have their own state, Israel should go away, Israel doesn't have anything to do with this area, we've been here forever. Now, it was interesting at the conference, there was a, a Palestinian doctor from Gaza, a uh, fairly well-respected oncologist in the world of oncology. He's actually been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, who grew up in a what I'm going to refer to as a Palestinian refugee camp in, in Gaza, uh, went to medical school, made a career, got married, had eight children. In about 2009, there was an Israeli airstrike in connection with some of the disputes going on there with the Gaza Strip in Israel. And three of his daughters, one of them 15 years old, and a niece were killed in that airstrike. Now, there's some question as to whether it was actually an Israeli airstrike. There have been some reports, never confirmed, that um, shrapnel from Qassam, ro Qassam rockets were found in the bodies of the young girls. But because of the political and military situation, it's really been able to, nobody's really been able to get a definitive answer on that. So I assume, you know, look, I'll just give the guy the benefit of the doubt that there was an Israeli airstrike on a military target in the Gaza Strip and his children, unfortunately, were killed. I did have an interesting day on the second day of the conference. I sat down at lunch. Uh, there was a couple empty chairs next to me. And lo and behold, here comes Steven Sizer and sits down next to me. Uh, we, I tried to engage him a little bit, but it was pretty clear he wanted to engage with someone else at the table. Uh, so we, we had a fairly cordial conversation. Later that day at dinner, I sat down, there was an empty chair between me and another gentleman. And then this Palestinian doctor came and sat down right next to me. So I did, and I talked a little bit about this in the prophecy update I did at church this past Sunday. Um, I did engage with the doctor. He was very cordial. Uh, I, they never announced at the conference whether what his religious orientation was, uh, but when he sat down, they had given us uh, mashed potatoes that were mashed with the skins on them, and he was very concerned about whether the potatoes were halal. You know, was, was that dark stuff in the potatoes, was it bacon? And I tried to assure him, you know, look at me, I'm a big guy, I know bacon, I know what bacon looks like, it tastes like. And I can assure you that that's not bacon, but he uh, he wouldn't eat them because he wasn't sure. So it was pretty clear that he was an observant Muslim. And we had an opportunity to engage. And during the course of the thing, I mentioned to him, I said, well, you yourself are a refugee. And he was, oh, no, 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 I'm not a refugee. Well, less than an hour later, an hour or so later, he was up speaking in front of the, the conference. And he said, I'm a, I'm a refugee. So not sure what it was. He grew up in a refugee camp. It's called a Palestinian refugee camp, even though there was no Palestine at the time. Um, but look, he grew up in a very harsh environment and he did make something of himself, but I tried to engage him on some of the topics. I think it's always good to, to engage these people. I had some pushback from a few friends, like, why did you go? Why are you posting about this? And I think if we don't go and look at the arguments of people that are diametrically opposed to what we believe, I'm, I'm very pro-Israel. I don't agree with everything that Israel does. Sometimes I don't think they react strongly enough. I mean, if you go to Israel, there's a lot of people that are upset with the Israeli government right now because they've let this thing in Gaza go on for so long. So I, I, I tried to engage him. I said, listen, I've been to Nablus last year. My wife and I went to Israel and one of the places we went to Nablus. It's one of the largest uh, cities in Palestine. It might be, it actually might be the largest uh, Palestinian Arab city. It's in what's called the West Bank. It's actually in the biblical region of Samaria. Uh, it's where biblical Shechem is. I think I might have mentioned that on one of the, the times we got together. Yeah. And when you when you go up on Mount Gerizim, there uh, above Nablus, 
you look down on Nablus and you see a lot of what you would call middle class to upper class homes and apartment buildings. But right in the middle of them is this very densely populated uh, place known as Balata, which is a Palestinian refugee camp. And it's been there for 70 years. It's actually grown. It's actually grown more dense. And so I talked to the doctor about, you know, you live in Ga- you, you live in Gaza, you grew up in a refugee camp. And I go to Nablus and I see this refugee camp and it looks awful. I mean, it's, the, you know, the buildings are built on top of each other. They're probably structurally unsound uh, because the population, the Palestinian, the Palestinian population has grown since the 1948 War of Independence between Israel and the surrounding states. Uh, and so I said, look, it, it looks bad. And I, I assume that this is a very oppressive, bad place to live up. But uh, I then look like right in the neighborhoods right around this refugee camp and they look fine. And I'm not sure I understand why people live a, a somewhat decent life at just, you know, feet away from this refugee camp. Why are these people still in the refugee camp after 70 years? And he said, oh, you know, it's the disease. The disease is the occupation, John. The disease is the occupation. And I said, well, that's fine. But then if I go over to Jordan, you know, I could find over a dozen refugee camps and 72% of the uh, population of Jordan, at least before the influx of the Syrian refugees, 72% of the Jordanian population is Palestinians. And I said, they live in refugee camps in an Arab country. And I said, if I go up to Syria, I see uh, Arabs, Palestinian Arabs living in a refu- refugee camps throughout Syria. And I could go to Lebanon the same way and probably, and I'm pretty sure to Egypt. And so everywhere the, the Palestinians go, they live in these refugee camps. They're denied rights. They can't vote. They can only work in certain occupations. And in many respects, the restrictions put on them in Jordan and Syria and Lebanon are as restrictive as, as what is put on them in Israel. And so I'm not sure I understand why is it the Israeli occupation here, but what is causing these people to live in refugee camps elsewhere? And he, he really didn't have any answer for that. He just kept wanting to bring it back to the That's occupation. So, it? yeah, it, it was an interesting conversation. It was very cordial. It was very animated, uh, as you might expect. Uh, but I wasn't. And, and so I, I mainly did it not because I'm. <laughs> so much better than anybody else at doing these things. But I think we need to be, we need to engage people and we need to ask them tough questions. And so what I tried to do there was I tried to find an area that we agreed on refugee camps are oppressive and bad, and then use that to areas where he didn't have an explanation for where the same thing was happening. That's a good way of Uh, taking it. Yeah. And so, because because he can't argue with the facts. And it was very interesting. There was a gentleman st- sitting there, probably in his 70s. Why, well, you know, I've stayed in Palestinian homes and it's not such a nice place and they're oppressed and their re- movements are restricted. And I acknowledge that all of that was true. Uh, but I think what what happened at that conference or the orientation of that conference is most of the people are on the left. They're on the left religiously. They're on the left politically. So when you when you engage them, they are operating for the most part on an emotional level. They don't really care about facts. I've mentioned this, I'm a trial lawyer. Trial lawyers are supposed to present facts to a judge or to a jury. But at some point in my training and my career at long now long career as a lawyer, the orientation of how we train our lawyers changed from how to effectively present facts to how to to appeal to people's emotions. And part of that was because of the rise of the political, religious, and socio-political left in America and elsewhere, where things seem to run on emotion and not facts. Let me give you a concrete example. Uh, We have this... uh, caravan of people described in our media as marching from Honduras to Guatemala to Mexico on their way to the United States. When I talk to someone on the political left about it, the religious left about it, it's always, 
oh, look at those poor refugees and people. We have to help them. This is really bad. But nobody wants to examine the facts. So it's sort of an experiment on my Facebook page. I put up a map. I, I just went to Google Maps. I put a starting point at the capital of uh, Honduras. And I chose Laredo, Texas as the end point. And I just said, you know, plot the map, plot the route. I copied it. I pasted it. And I said, look, this is 1,700 miles. If they were covering 25 miles a day, it would take them 68 days. Um, a couple of days later, ABC, and I copied the map off of the ABC broadcast, they did almost the identical map, except they went a little bit further straight west from Honduras through Guatemala to Honduras to the a border crossing in Mexico. But even the ABC report said, Look, to get to Brownsville, Texas, they're going to travel 1,500 miles. This started a week ago, they said, and they've covered 521 miles. <laughs> now, and, and they show these pic, you know, they show these long, you know, the road full of people walking and that type of thing. Now, I was, you know, the old saying is, I was born at night, Tony, but I wasn't born last night. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just put that up on Facebook. I said, it would appear that something up, and I put in parentheses, I really do know that something is up. Somebody's funding this. I mean, how do you, um, uh, somebody asked a question on Facebook, like, where are these people getting water? Another one, where are they getting food? How are they making such great progress? How are they covering, which according to the ABC News report, they were covering over 70 miles a day. In, in hot, central, hot, hot, sultry, tropical Central America, no one's died of heat stroke yet. So a few people may have collapsed. How is this possible? And uh, Sunday morning, one of my South African friends sent me a message and said, do you know that your, your Facebook post with that map has been shared? It just hit 10,000 shares, which is... Mm fairly viral for a private person yeah. on Facebook. So I watched it uh, Sunday and Monday. I was getting anywhere from 15 to 30 to even sometimes 50 shares a minute of that map. And by um, this morning, I checked it. It was up to 31,000 shares. Wow. Um, so, it, it, but it was just a little like, hey, how about we look at the facts yeah. of this? Yeah. And and this is this is the this is one of the great divides in our world. It's it divides the church, it divides uh, politics, it the it, it because a lot of people, I would have to say half the people in the world don't care about the facts. There's a bus tour going on. So the the Trice of the Checkpoint Conference took place in Oklahoma City. It was it was a very interesting long weekend I sp spent there Friday morning I flew out and Friday Saturday and Sunday I attended the prophecy watchers conference you know 33 speakers four rooms uh, a prophecy palooza if you want to call it that uh, Gary Stearman and Bob Bell work uh, yeah I'm just, I'm, I don't want to go into it but I think it's I, I, I've questioned this before why do they choose 33 speakers I mean those of us like me are always exposing 33 as an occultic right. Masonic number. Why are they choosing that? I mean, we probably shouldn't get into that here because that's derailing yeah, well, things. Well, but it, it, it was good. Look, these are people, they love the Lord, they love Bible prophecy, they love to study the Bible. Uh, and a lot of people were from, I mean, I couldn't walk 10 feet, it seemed like, without somebody stopping me and saying, hey, I watch you on YouTube and that yeah. type of thing. And thank you. It was very encouraging to me. So, but it was a, it, but it, you know, they're very pro-Israel, uh, as a, in that uh, particular ministry, and then I go to this anti-Israel conference just across town. It also I learned later was there's this bus tour that's going on. It's um, it's called for the common good. It's the it's essentially the emergent church types, the Brian McLarens, the Doug Padgets, and such are on a bus tour around America to sway people to vote Democratic in the upcoming election in uh, now just in 13 days. The 
but it's interesting what Paget said, and this this is why this drives me insane. This not looking at the facts and driving on emotion. Paget said, if you Christians want to do something about abortion, you need to vote Democratic. Now that's illogical and detached from the the world of facts on many, many levels. I don't know why he would say that, but that's just, that's sort of a glaring example of what's going. Here in my own town in November, there's going to be a religious, interfaith religious surface to celebrate choice and, and contraception, mainly focused on the wonderful thing of abortion. Correct. I, it, it's it's just it's insane. So mm. so this was typical of the arguments, the statements, the things that happened at Christ of the Checkpoint, largely based on the emotions of the situation. There, there's no doubt that these people are oppressed, but they're not concerned with the facts. One example, I, I asked the guy, I said, well, look, so I have a Facebook friend, a man named Ari Fold. He goes to the store a month ago. And he's stabbed in the back by a Palestinian teenager. He chases him. He does shoot him, doesn't kill him, but he injures him. And then Ari, a father of four, 45 years old, probably if I would say someone who captures the spirit of the modern state of Israel, I would have thought of Ari Fold. He died. He, the, the knife attack had severed his aorta. And yet he was still able to uh, he's a pretty tough guy. He was still able to chase him down about 70 yards before he collapsed and died. And then then the doctor said, well, but, you know, there was a lady, a lady in her family that was killed in the West Bank the other day by an attack of Jewish settlers. Now, I don't think the facts have established that it was Jewish settlers, but he said it was a woman in her family. And I went back and looked up and there was a woman killed, I think, by a rock that was thrown. But it wasn't her whole family. And this this is the problem is, you know, we can't even agree on the facts. And how are we ever going to get to the truth when we can't even agree on the facts and everybody's being driven by propaganda? Mm. Um, but I, I think this is a sim- symptom of the end times, Tony. It's yeah. how it's how things are going to be. Yeah. Now, going back to that caravan of people coming to America, what are you? What are your thoughts on what do you expect is going to happen there? Well, I'm I'm concerned about it. Uh, they're, you know, they made 500 miles in seven days. Um, they get so seven days was two weeks before the election. So if they get the next thousand miles in the next 14 days, they'll be here right at the time of the election. And I, I, this is to provoke a confrontation. I I have no doubt that some of these people probably qualify for asylum, but in many respects, uh, looking at some of the videos, uh, some of the videos show large groups of military age males. Yeah. The videos on the mainstream media media show women and children. Um, there are now, uh, pictures emerging of, uh, large flatbed trucks, semi-trailers, that type of thing. Somebody made a comment on our YouTube channel. Well, you know, I heard on the Lawfare podcast, which is put on by the Brookings Institution, which is, uh, a think tank in DC funded by, um, Heim, um, his last name begins with S. He's a he owns the uh, Telemundo, the big uh, Spanish language network in Mexico. Uh, Heim, well, I can't remember what his name is, but he funds the Brookings Institution. It's a left wing organization. Uh, it would be politically aligned with J Street, which is a left wing Israeli organization that, you know, is pushing for a two-state solution there between Israel and Palestine. And he, so this person, I listened to this podcast and they said that this, uh, all the funding for this uh, caravan, and listen, it's, there's 5,000 people. Some estimates are ten or 14,000 people going through Mexico. I, you got to feed those people. You know, you got to have, 
somebody on my Facebook page said, where are they peeing and pooping? To which one of my clever friends responded, they're peeing and pooping on our constitution. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a, one of the more clever responses yeah. retorts I've seen on Facebook. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of allegations that uh, Soros NGOs are, are funding it. Soros nonprofits are, are, are paying for the, uh, the trucks and the water. I mean, just think of the water alone that you have to have mm. in the hot tropics yeah. to move that many people that far. This is not the first time it happened. It was back about 2014 or 15. We had somewhere in the neighborhood of 75,000 children that came from Central America, showed up on the border of the United States. Now, listen, I did a map back in those days. It was about Fifteen to eighteen hundred miles. Most of them were showing up around the Arizona border. So if you go from Honduras, Guatemala to uh, Arizona, it's probably closer to two thousand miles. How do seventy thousand children walk across Mexico, largely in many cases without parents or any other adults? And who and organized it-, it for a start? I mean, to have masses of people doing that. It doesn't happen organically, surely. Somebody has well, to it, have organized it. Right. But you watch these mainstream ABC, CNN news reports, and they're like, oh, look at these poor people walking across Mexico just spontaneously. And but and they all look fine. I mean, they, they showed a picture. One of the clips I captured off of ABC was uh, – weary and blistering feet or something like that. And then there's a lady right in the background. There's a little kid putting like a four-year-old putting on his tennis shoes that look brand new. You just walk 500 miles in seven days. Yeah. And then in the back, there's a lady with her shoes off and her feet look fine. Now this, but nobody in the mainstream media says, wait a minute, this just doesn't seem quite right. Yeah. How, how was this happening? And nobody asked the bigger question. So what's happening, Tony, this is to um, cause a confrontation of some kind on the border to affect the midterm elections. These are important elections here in the United States. Uh, Will the Republicans maintain control of the House of Representatives and the Senate? And let me tell you, the polls are all over the place. I read, you know, what I call mainstream places like the Washington Post, the New York Times. Oh, the Democrats, they're going to take back the Senate. They're going to take back the House. The Republicans are over. And I'm sure part of that is to suppress the Republican turnout. And then I read other polls that say it's going to be a very close call. It's going to come down to a few congressional districts. And the Democrats don't look like they're going to be able to take the Senate. Uh, In my opinion, they took back both. Um, I'm not sure the United States would survive at this point, given just some of the recent things that happened, say, with the Kavanaugh nomination. And I can't remember if that had happened or was in process. It was in time. process. I think it happened within oh, probably less than a day after you were last on. So what? Um, just it's interesting to note it's come out, it's packages or whatever been sent to George Soros and Obama and Clinton and so on. Have you been caught up with that? Suspicious packages? Yeah, I've been looking at it. I mean, it appears that they've been uh, confirmed that they were pipe bombs. Uh, some were, they said that the Soros, at least the news I saw, coming down before we talked or heard on the radio coming home today uh, was that the Soros bomb was a live active bomb. Now, I wonder now if he planted is, it himself. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, surprise I'm me. not a big, I think I've told you before, I'm not a, I, I prefer the simple explanation and I'm not a big uh, conspiracy theory, false flag type of guy. I'm, I'm very skeptical of, especially when I see, you know, something happens and within five minutes, somebody has got a YouTube video up about why this is a false flag. In, in some cases in which I know people who know the people who were actually 
you know, because they'll get on and say, well, that person, that reporter, so look at her run away. She wasn't really shot. This was one in Roanoke. But we know people that live in Roanoke and that these people really were killed in the, in the shooting. So I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic when it comes to these. But in this case, um, maybe, maybe I've been worn down <laughs> over the years, but it just seems ob- too convenient. And as soon as the the bombs are found, there the Democrats are all over the press. The president issued a statement condemning this. We can't do this as Americans. This is bad. The full weight of the uh, federal government will be put behind this investigation to find the perpetrator or perpetrators and bring them to justice. And so, what was the Democrat response? I saw the response of Nancy Pelosi the minority leader in the House of Representatives and Chuck Schumer, the minority leader in the United States Senate. And they were saying, oh, well, yeah, Trump said that, but he should condemn the 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 Nazis, the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville that killed people a year ago that he supported. Now, he didn't support them. He never supported them. It's a bald-faced lie. But what you're seeing now is everybody in the media is running with this. Two nights ago, the president had a big rally um, in Houston, I think. 18,000 people showed up to hear him, and there were at least, uh, from what I've heard, that many people turned away outside. They couldn't get into the arena. And he talked about he believed in nationalism. And so for the last day, two days, the narrative in the media has been the the president is a racist. He's sending a dog whistle to his followers that it's okay to attack people. And then boom, today we have these bombs showing yesterday Soros. And today, I don't know, five or six more of these letter bombs or packages showing up at Obama's place, the Clintons, um, and a couple other place. I think Eric Holder, the former attorney general, there was one found at his house. So, um, and so now the narrative is going to be, see, Trump is, Trump is fomenting all this division and there's racism, et cetera. And I just, you know, what, uh, what, what gets me is that why does nobody see Hegelian dialectic and auto auto ab chaos and auto ab chaos and all of this? It, it, it's kind of like the left is this and the left is that and this is coming from the on those on the right and the left are going and the right is that and the right is that and you know and so you got all of this going on that trumps the good guy to some and trumps the terrible bad guy to others. And I'm looking at and George Soros is the good guy or the bad guy depending on and I'm looking at it going. It's staring me in the face. This is orchestrated. There is no yeah. good guy on the right and bad guy on the left or vice versa. This is an orchestrated plot to bring chaos and division, and I think both sides are colluding in it. That's Somebody above both sides is colluding in it. There's not The answer is not to have a right-wing government or a left-wing government or whatever. The whole thing is this is... It's an organized chaos, and qu- quite frankly, I just I don't see an answer uh, to it coming. You well, know? I, I do think that we are um, way past the tipping point. Yeah, and at that's the risk where of I'm getting yeah. people who might listen to me. I've, I've been very clear. There's stuff that I like that Trump has done. Yeah. I'll admit it. But there's stuff that he does that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't care for the... 5 a.m. tweets and uh, and some of the la- attack language that he uses and that sort of thing, but you know, in some respects, he's been fairly effective. They just were having the uh, hearings today on four more appellate court judges. I mean, he's he he's put in about a third of the federal appellate court judges in just his his two years in office. It's it's pretty. Well, he hasn't even really been in office two years yet, but it's pretty stunning the the change that he has been able, he and his team have been able to bring about to the federal judiciary that could go on for, you know, if the Lord doesn't come, could affect things and the United States survives, 
could affect things for uh, a generation. I mean, it's 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 pretty stunning. But uh, I agree with you that there's this. Uh, it's them. It's them and the fighting and. Uh, I, I've told people, I've said this in my prophecy updates, I do think that we are uh, past the tipping point. I, I don't see that there's any walking things back from this point forward. No, um, that's, pr- that's pretty clear, I think. And there's so many other things to throw in <clears throat> to the mix with the economic situation, and and that's you know looking pretty ominous at the moment. Um, but what about this whole Saudi Arabian murder? Do, you know, is well, that, this is this a, um, a black swan event or something that could trigger? You know, I mean, I think of Donald Trump that sold the biggest arms deal in history to the Saudi Arabians, and then you get this. It's like, hmm, what are your thoughts? Well, um, it, it, it's clear. Um, I'll, I'll try to take a, a, a bit. Of, let, let's say I'll take the the pro-Trump view of everything that's going on here, uh, just because that's probably where it, it's more in my comfort zone. Yeah. Um, first of all, I don't want my remarks to be construed that I thought it was okay to assassinate Khashoggi. But uh, listen, this was a bad guy. This was a uh, rabid supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, of the imposition of Sharia law everywhere. Uh, the oppression of women and everything that went along with that. He was a supporter of Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. He was a, a sort of had become over years a, a thorn in the flesh of the Saudi royal family. Uh, he was clearly tied into uh, the Muslim. The, let's just say the Muslim Brotherhood network. As a result of that, he had access to certain things. But what was most shocking about this has been the reaction of, say, the Washington Post. But probably one of the two most New York Times and Washington Post are clearly the most two most influential newspapers in the United States. And the Washington Post has a large uh, media group to go along with the newspaper as well. Washington Post immediately last week, about Friday, on the front page headlines, I'll cover this a little bit Sunday, started going because because people came out in the media on the let's say it on the political geopolitical right and said Khashoggi was a bad guy and his fiance who's you know been pushing a lot of this the memory of Khashoggi is probably more radical islamist than Khashoggi was and the Washington Post to say oh look the far right in America has started this whisper campaign against the great freedom freedom fighter Khashoggi, and they they've turned this guy into a saint. It's almost identical. It's the so Khashoggi has become the Saudi version of the saintinization, or whatever you would call it, of John McCain. I mean, John McCain when he ran for president was hated by the Washington Post, but as he came to the near the end of his life and he was against Trump he became I mean I'm surprised he hasn't been put in the canon of saints in the Vatican <laughs> or someplace yeah, I yeah. mean good I mean and it was like I mean his funeral got almost as much coverage as Ronald Reagan's for, mm. for crying out loud and it was uh and I I don't really care for John McCain. I know people who know him and they just said, look, he was a very self-centered guy. Let's just leave it at that. And, and now here Khashoggi is being done the same way to the point where it's affecting international geopolitics. It's, it's a way to drive a wedge into the Trump administration and the Trump team. Jared Kushner has worked closely with Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince. They have a pretty strong relationship in trying to craft some kind of regional peace arrangement to calm down things in the Middle East. Ben Salman came on the scene. He had, from most respects, he had a meteoric rise. When he started to rise to power between the then crown prince, one of his, I think, half-brothers, 
and him, the rivalry developed. Jared Kushner threw in with Mohammed bin Salman to the chagrin and, and with the opposition of many in the National Intelligence Administration. They did not like that. And when Mohammed bin Salman rose to power, Kushner looked like he knew what he was talking about, even though Kushner is kind of this, um, nobody knows that much about him. I mean, they know it comes from a real estate development family. He owned the building at 666 Fifth Avenue. Uh, I think they've, they've sort of exited from that deal. Uh, it, was, it was the most expensive real estate deal in New York history. Uh, just down the street from the Trump Tower, interestingly enough. Um, and Kushner, I don't know, I I don't know him. <laughs> I just find him kind of mysterious. Uh, I have concerns about him. He yeah. always seems to wear the same suit. And I'm like, I thought only Superman got to wear the same suit every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, but when Nikki Haley was resigning a couple weeks ago, or now her resignation as the UN ambassador, she said that Kushner is the secret genius in the White House on these issues. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, what's going on? So he reminds me doing, of Damien from the Iman movie. <laughs> yeah, well, he does. So, and he, I mean, he's always sort of rigid. He did a long interview. You might look it up with uh, Don Lemon. I think it was Don Lemon, somebody from CNN, uh, just the other day talking about some of these issues. So the Khashoggi thing is being used as a political wedge now. Uh, the New York, uh, you know, they're lionizing Khashoggi and look how bad the Trump administration is for making these deals with the Saudis. We have to s sanction the Saudis, and I think Trump announced some sanctions today. But I don't think people understand what could happen. I mean, I've seen interviews with, Saudi insiders that say, listen, you put too many sanctions on us, oil's going to go to 80, 100, 200, maybe $400 a barrel uh, if we cut back on production. Now, the U.S. might be able to weather that storm because of fracking and that sort of thing, but this will collapse the world economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just over, I, I'm so also looking back at parallels between this thing, this Khashoggi murder, and I think it's, there's no doubt now that, that he was murdered in the embassy. Everybody admits that they yeah. found his body. His face had been disfigured. He'd been dismembered. Um, the parallels between Khashoggi as a trigger for kind of a, maybe a worldwide conflagration and war, similar to what happened when the crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire was Fugit assassinated Fugit in Sarajevo yeah. in 1914. Yeah. So, you know, because, I mean, who Arch would have Duke thought Ferdinand, that? Ferdinand, I think is the name yeah, was, wasn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And so who thought that that assassination would lead to World War I? And, and listen, what all the, the things and the sort of the endless wars, the hundreds of millions of people killed and everything that have consumed us for the last hundred years now. Um, and so is, is Khashoggi the trick? You know, I always say there's a trigger to these things is Khash Khashoggi could be the trigger because it could lead to, uh, an econ you know, rising oil prices and economic collapse. And when, Governments get in economic trouble. They start wars, and you know the drill. I mean, yeah. you know it as well as anybody else. And so, it, I mean, is this all planned? The interesting sort of maybe micro to macro geopolitical thing about this is the speech. I saw the speech yesterday that uh, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, gave, and Erdogan is now. Uh, touting himself as the great protector of journalistic freedom in the world. And <laughs> when there's hundreds of people rotting in jails yeah. under the Turkish regime of Erdogan. So it's, again, the facts don't really matter. It's this fluidity and the change of geopolitics that I think is characteristic of the all of the end time scenarios that you want to pull out of the Bible. Look, it, it's hard. I, 
I'm sort of taking more of the position that being in, uh, incredibly dogmatic about exactly how this prophetic scenario unfolds is probably not the wisest thing to do. Yeah. Because um, things change. I mean, listen, all, all the people who talk about Gog, Magog and all this, and I do too, believe me, I, I watch the alignment of the nations and that sort of thing. But nobody, nobody predicted that this um, opinion writer, pro-Muslim Brotherhood guy, would be uh, turned into a saint and cause a crisis between the United States and one of its allies in the Middle East. And nobody predicted that. Nobody saw that coming. Mm. So we need to be a little bit humble as to exactly how this all plays out. But I do think Turkey is a major player in the end times. And uh, I, I don't agree with my uh, friends who think that, you know, a Gog-Magog war will completely neutralize Islam. I think this Islamic thing is around until the Lord returns and he ultimately will take care of it. So I, I, I don't think any of these wars that I see in the Middle East that are prophesied, that I think are clearly prophesied. I just don't see that taking care of this Islamic problem. And so what Erdogan has done is Erdogan is very Muslim Brotherhood. When the Muslim Brotherhood was coming to power in Egypt during the Arab Spring, the guy that went down there to show them what to do. Now, it failed. They got a little bit, they tried to do it too quickly. They tried to compress into a couple of months what it took Erdogan over a decade to do in Turkey. That was, that was their big mistake. And they they upset the people, and the people revolted, and other people with power revolted against that. But Erdogan has now been able to sort of have move himself into the head of the Arab world. All of those Syrian Arab refugees, three million have ended up in Turkey. About a, half of those have ended up in Istanbul. In fact, I can pull up the... Um, well, I thought I had the story here. What Erdogan has done, the the art, this was from foreign policy, uh, which I, I consider sort of a middle of the road uh, foreign policy analysis thing. I subscribe to it because they have people from right, they have people from left, they have people in the middle. So you just have to kind of learn how to read what they write. But but what um, Erdogan, but they said. Istanbul is now, you ready for this, an Arab city, an Arab Muslim city, mm. because of all the Arabs that Erdogan has let in that align with him, that would be sort of like the Khashoggi's, the pro-Muslim Brotherhood people. And so Erdogan is very cleverly playing this whole thing. He's going to get himself back in the good graces of the United States. He's going to get his F-35s. Mm, interesting. Um, and and I, I'm just I'm just telling you is the guy who's coming out of this nice and clean is Erdogan, and you're going to see him play this like uh, uh, the master on a fiddle. Mm. And I I have um, I have very grave concerns about an Erdogan and his role. Whether it's him or somebody that comes after him, I, I don't think there's any question that Turkey is a major player in the end times, what yeah. they're getting. And then if you look at, for example, if you look at the um, Ezekiel 38, 39 prophecy, it, it talks about Gomer and all of his bands. And I personally believe that Gomer is the Central Asian Muslim republics. Um the one thing that would unite them, this this is the one thing that you get from Christ at the checkpoint, from watching these geopolitics, is they all hate Israel. And yeah. we know that the prof the prophecies are that they will come against Israel in the latter times. So I have said, I'm not bragging, but I have said for 20 years, um, and I think I could probably document this, but the I do think Russia is involved in this. I mean, I think China's involved too in this this final conflagration against the returning king. But there's also a push against Israel, and I think Russia 
if I understand this correctly, may be drawn into this. I'll turn you back. I'll draw you in. I'll put hooks in your jaw. And Russia had Russia. I've talked about this many times. Russia has a Sunni Islam problem. I believe the last numbers I saw were somewhere around 27% of Moscow is Sunni Muslim. Mm, 27%. Yeah. It's pretty high. And so what, what, what would get those people off his back? This, if what would get him make allies with the Central Asian Republics, which Erdogan and not Erdogan, Putin and his Russian nationalism considers the fall of the Soviet Union the great catastrophe of the 20th century. What what would get those Arab those Muslim republics back on his side? Attacking Israel? I mean, I, that's one thing where they're all united. It appears. So, I just think all this plays into this. But the interesting thing is. The rise of Turkey. Look, it's a. Uh, it has the outside of the United States. It has the largest army, armed forces, in Europe. Uh, it's the seventeenth largest economy. Erdogan is engaged in a massive building program. He they will soon open. I think within a matter of weeks, the new Istanbul airport. It's on the European side of the Bosporus, and it will be. Uh, is on track to be the largest airport in the world. He is building mosques all over the world, massive mosques outside of D.C. These mosques are used to track Turkish citizens everywhere. They're used to uh, as intelligence sources. Look, Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing with the money they have in the development of technology and their support of A.I., they're holding a conference right now called the Davos of the Arab world uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. The uh, crown prince was at it just yesterday. So all of these, there's, there's a lot of pieces in play right now. There's things going on everywhere. I, I would just say, look, the other thing you need to do is you need to watch Syria and the Russian Iranian thing in Syria. I, I look, I think, however we look at this, sort of the epicenter of the geopolitical thing in the end times is Israel. Um, there are things, you know, Israel's big into AI technology, associations with China and that type of thing. I mean, things that concern me, I think things that concern people in Israel. The growth of this AI technology, I would recommend, uh, it's a left-wing magazine, leans left, but a magazine that I find to be thoughtful, left-leaning magazine, The Atlantic has a large, it's, it's technology issues. So it's talking about artificial intelligence. I think this, you, these things are that you need to look at, assume that it's going to be a turbulent geopolitical world, assume that things are going to revolve in large part around Israel and its relationships with other countries. Assume that there's going to be this, um, soft alliance that kind of comes and goes between Turkey and Iran and Russia and other countries, look for them to bring some other people into their orbit. Um, and then we haven't even talked about the economic thing. No, uh, no, yeah, stock times, market yeah. gave, today get back, gave back all of its profits for the year. Uh, people that, I mean, I saw an article today that the Fed feels like they're losing control. And some of, some of this is planned, Tony. Some of this is just market forces that happen and that people really can't control. I, I feel like the world lives right now in kind of the midst of a Category 4 trending towards a Category 5 hurricane. Mm. Uh, and everything's swirling around. Yeah. We we see these natural disasters. They now happen, it seems like, in in twos. There's a hurricane followed by a flood, a hurricane and an earthquake, an earthquake and a hurricane, an earthquake, a tsunami, and a volcano going off in, in the same area. Uh, and one of my friends suggested that, you know, listen, this seems to be unusual out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, double disasters, double disasters, triple disasters. It does appear that something's going on. 
and people need to be to pay attention. Like you need to get your life your life right with the Lord. This this is not a time to be putting that off. It, it'll be a turbulent time. I to be honest with you though, I'm not that personally upset. I expect this to happen. Um, I think it's the outworking of God's plan, but it, it is, there are days I will confess when I look at it and I say, I don't, I don't think I can take it anymore. It's just too crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Give me one example on the way out. Somebody sent me this, uh, Amazon, they have a shirt. It's by a gender graphic or something like that. It says there are more than two genders. And then you look to the right of it and it gives you, it comes in men's and women's sizes. <laughs> no, wait, <laughs> it says there are more than two genders, but uh, it only comes in men's yeah. and women's sizes. So that that's kind of, I think, capulate, encapsulates the craziness that we have on our world today. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a time for people to be, you know, Christians should be fellowshipping with Christians, preferably in person, studying their Bible, getting rooted in the truth, because we live at a time where deception is running rampant. Absolutely. Yes. And it's only going to grow. Well, um, thanks again, John. This has been a fascinating discussion and gosh, we'll have to do it again before too long because... Uh, there's always so much comes out of these uh, these interviews. That. Thanks a lot. And, then, and sometime we'll actually have an outline before we start. <laughs> Look, <laughs> honestly, yeah, we could have carried on with a whole lot more. But, yeah. Sure. So uh, there's always so many things. But well, thank you. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Folks, we put all of our shows on our website, a minute to midnight.com with midnight spelled M I D N I T E. Don't forget to visit our website, like the video, and bookmark our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. We also have our shows on iTunes as audio only downloads and so on if you want to listen on iTunes and subscribe there as well. And we do run a minute to midnight completely by donations. If you're able to help us, we much appreciate it. Uh, we're very grateful to those that do help by donating. And you can do that on our website. Uh, also, all the music in the shows is written, played and recorded by me. And if you want to download any of it, you can download the music for free also on our website. We have a forum too on the website, which you're welcome to join. In a minute to midnight forum where we discuss all kinds of things. So these things are all on our website, so don't forget to visit it and bookmark it. I think that's about it for today's show, and we will catch you with another episode of A Minute to Midnight in a few days' time. Until then, God bless, and this is Tony saying goodbye.